Okay, I'm showing it's 3 p.m., so we will go ahead and get started today. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the 2022 Psychi webinar series. Our series this year is sponsored by APA Style. And also presenting our webinar today will be presenters from APA Style. Now, before we get started, let me please ask you to keep yourself muted during the presentation so that there's not feedback. And also, I'd like to remind you to use the chat feature to ask questions. And there will be a Q&A at the end of the presentation. So I'd like to read some quick bios of our uh, contributors today. Dr. Haley Kameen is a content development manager with the APA style team of the American Psychological Association. She started working at APA in 2018 and was part of the team responsible for writing and updating the seventh edition of the publication manual and the concise guide to APA style. Prior to working at APA, Haley received a PhD in developmental psychology from the University of Florida and help me welcome our presenter today, Chelsea Lee. Chelsea Lee is a content development manager also on the APA style team. She has worked at APA since 2007, beginning as a manuscript editor for APA journals before moving on to the then newly formed style team in 2015. Chelsea has a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in education and human development. Please help me in welcoming them to us today, and we'll go ahead and get started with our webinar. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Thank you all for being here. And I want to say hello and welcome to So You Need to Write a Literature Review, Understanding the Key Tasks and How to Accomplish Them, part of the Psychi webinar series presented by me, Chelsea Lee, with help from Haley Kamen from the APA style team at the American Psychological Association. In this session, you're going to learn how to select and refine a topic for your literature review paper, evaluate secondary sources for accuracy, find trustworthy and useful primary sources, approach the writing and citation process, and format a literature review paper in APA style. Let's begin with where to get started with your literature re review paper. First, what is a literature review? A literature review is a summary and evaluation of existing research on a topic. It can be its own paper or one section of a larger research paper, such as the report of an experiment. Today, I'm going to be talking about a literature review as its own paper. To conduct a literature review, you'll need to choose a topic, find trustworthy and useful sources about the topic, explain the state of research to readers with proper citation, and identify areas for future investigation. When you choose a topic for a literature review, it's key to pick something that fits the length of your assignment. 15 to 20 pages is common, but your instructor might ask for something shorter or longer. A common pitfall is choosing a topic that is too broad or is vaguely defined. It's so common, in fact, that we're gonna start with our own too broad topic, COVID-19 and mental health, and I'll show you how to refine the topic as we go. Let's start by talking about source selection. So in today's world, there's lots of different kinds of sources that report or describe scientific research. These include journal articles, books and book chapters, newspaper and magazine articles, blog posts and social media posts, and all different kinds of reports. These sources can be divided into two categories primary sources and secondary sources. Primary sources report original research. They're usually written by the people who conducted the research, meaning scientists who probably work at universities. 
The audience of the work is other scientists, and since you're writing a literature review, that means you too. The language of primary sources is often technical and maybe difficult to understand if you're not an expert. The citations are thorough. You can see where they got their information. And primary sources are published in scientific journals that may be available only in academic research databases that you have to access through your school's library portal. On the other hand, secondary sources are secondhand reports of original research. They're usually written by journalists for an audience of the general public. Sometimes the journalists are also experts in science, but sometimes not. The language is usually simpler and easier to understand, but citations might be missing or poorly labeled, making it hard to know what the source even is. Secondary sources appear in popular media on the internet, meaning that on the whole, they're much more widely available than primary sources of research. You probably already know that you should use primary sources for your literature review, but I'm going to explain a bit about why. The chief reason is that science comes from primary sources. Primary sources report information that has been peer reviewed by other scientists to confirm it is rigorous and correct. The title of a primary source will be factual and descriptive. The study will provide complete details regarding samples, settings, and variables, and show the results or findings in their original context and with supporting data. On the other hand, secondary sources do not usually go through the same level of rigorous review. The headline might be sensational because its job is to grab your attention. The text may distort, misrepresent, or omit important details or leave out exceptions. The takeaways from secondary sources might be overstated, making the research seem more impactful than it really is. It's also common for non-scientists to confuse correlation and causation, to imply that one thing caused another, when the science says only that they're correlated with each other. So even though you shouldn't use secondary sources for your literature review, you need to be able to evaluate secondary sources for accuracy. Why? Because they're everywhere. Secondary sources can be a gateway for discovering a research topic. I mean, everybody has a friend who likes to share science on social media, right? You don't want to be misled in your understanding of a topic if you read a secondary source with significant flaws while you're doing your research. And you want to be able to identify the good secondary sources that can help you understand challenging primary sources better. And who knows? Maybe you can even help your friend on social media understand better too. Here's an example of how I recently checked two secondary sources and the primary source that they were about. So I was online and I saw a news story with the headline, even mild COVID can cause brain damage, study suggests. Reading this, I felt worried and also skeptical. So I found the original study and read it only to find many limitations. Issues as big as data collection being from before vaccines were widely available and that the study had not been peer reviewed yet. None of this was in the news story. However, the language of the primary source was incredibly dense. The example on screen is literally one sentence from the primary source. It's a description of the study limitations. So to help me understand, I found a different secondary source about that paper, and it featured an analysis from an infectious diseases expert who said the study was pretty convincing evidence of brain changes, but we don't want to scare the public and have them think, oh, this is proof that everyone's going to have brain damage and not be able to function. So the takeaway here is that some secondary sources can mislead you and others can help you understand but you can't tell the difference without looking at the primary source yourself. So to find primary sources, you might search on Google, Google Scholar, or in an academic research database. 
We recommend that you use academic research databases because the papers in academic research databases might not come up in a regular internet search. And more important, the contents of the research databases have been vetted to ensure that they're trustworthy. The people who make academic research databases do their best to keep out what are called predatory journals, which look like legit journals, but they actually publish low quality science with no peer review. You might get lured in by a predatory journal article if you're only searching on the internet. So in the academic research database, you'll need to find primary sources that are not only trustworthy, but also useful. If a topic is broad, like our example topic of COVID-19 and mental health, keyword searches produce too many potentially useful results. You can't possibly read them all. You can't possibly summarize them all in the page allotted for the assignment. So rather than wade through all those results or just picking one, the better option is to focus your topic so you can write about it at the right level of detail given the length of the assignment. In addition to usefulness, consider a source's recency and representativeness. In general, prioritize recent research over older research, especially in highly studied and fast moving domains. Like for our pandemic topic, was a study conducted before or after vaccines were widely available? Note that APA does not have a strict rule about how recent sources have to be. Like it's not use nothing older than three to five years, unless your instructor says that that's what they want. Check out a recent post on the APA style blog about the outdated sources myth for more. If you choose a topic that readers that researchers have studied for a long time, you should also cite the seminal or groundbreaking studies for the topic area, even if they're older, because this establishes the foundation of the topic for readers. However, don't choose outdated studies or retracted studies. And be wary of studies that have not yet been peer reviewed, like the one I showed earlier. The peer review process can uncover important flaws or limitations in the research that you otherwise wouldn't know about. Next, choose articles that are representative of the state of research in your topic area. A great strategy to find more good research is to check the reference lists of useful papers to see what studies those authors cited. Don't cherry pick the research you choose to describe in your lit review to, pre to fit preconceived ideas. Like if there are multiple legitimate competing theories about a topic, don't pretend like there's only one theory when you're writing your paper. Now I'll talk about how to focus your topic and how to use a strategy called targeted reading to choose sources efficiently. I think of focusing your topic as being like using filters when you're shopping online. You've got to hit that sweet spot where there are enough results to be useful, but not too many results. Except instead of filtering items by size or color, you add keywords to your searches in academic research databases to find more specific and useful results. Some ideas for what to filter for include personal characteristics of participants, like their age or gender, or any of the characteristics you'll find discussed in APA's bias-free language guidelines. You can also add keywords related to the setting in which the research took place, such as at school or at home, and the location, such as rural or urban, or different regions of a country or different countries. Another idea is to focus on the variables that the researcher studied such as different mental health or physical health diagnoses, like if participants have depression or diabetes. I recommend focusing on areas of a topic that are interesting to you. For our example topic, we decided to focus on what protective factors and what risk factors affect adolescent mental health in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
To avoid spending forever combing through articles, I recommend a strategy called targeted reading. Targeted reading means to read specific sections of research articles first to determine if the article seems like it'll be useful for your literature review. Side note, lots of people wonder why you have to use a writing style for academic papers, and here is a fabulous reason why. Styles are predictable. You can predict where to find the most useful information in an article, which allows you to find useful articles faster. Maximize the value of your time. Use targeted reading to choose which articles to read in full. Targeted reading is great because it'll help you understand what research says. It's sort of like reading spoilers for a movie before you watch it. You already know the major plot points and the ending, so the action is easier to follow. Here's how we like to do a targeted reading. First, read the abstract which is a summary of the research. You don't even have to open the article for this. Just read the abstract from the search results page. Then read the last one to two paragraphs of the introduction to learn the study's topic, variables, and research question. Read the method section to find out about the study's sample, setting, and measures. Look at the figures to get a visual summary of the results. Then read the beginning of the discussion section because that's where you're going to find the author's analysis of what their results mean and why they're important. Last, read the conclusion section or the final paragraphs of the discussion section to learn the author's final takeaways and future research ideas. If everything checks out from the targeted reading, you're ready to go back and read the full article. So, you've got your sources selected, and you've read them. But do you understand how the sources relate to each other, and what conclusions there are to draw about the literature as a whole? Maybe not yet. So, before you start writing the text of your paper, we recommend that you complete specific and focused analyses of each study. Writing a literature review can feel overwhelming, but when you break the writing process down into smaller writing tasks, it makes it more manageable and, bonus, helps you understand the material better. Remember that to write a literature review, you will need to not only summarize studies, but also compare and contrast them. You'll need to describe patterns and themes and strengths and limitations. For our paper, when we've done our job well, a reader should be able to say, I have a good understanding of what research says about protective and risk factors for adolescent mental health and COVID-19 after they're done reading. To accomplish all this, we recommend that you take detailed and systematic notes about each study that you're going to include in your literature review. The APA style team has created a note-taking and paraphrasing practice activity called the Research Article Activity, and it's available for free on our website. The activity takes you through the process of finding, citing, analyzing, and summarizing a scholarly research article. The activity has PDF form fields, so you can complete it on your computer and save a copy for each of the sources you plan to use. Once you've completed your research article activities, you will have summaries of the articles with proper in-text citations and the corresponding reference list entries that you can use in your paper. Now we're ready to start writing the paper. In this section, I'll show you our recipe for how to approach specific writing tasks, including identifying themes, describing studies, and writing a thesis statement as well as tips for honing your writing voice through paraphrasing and the use of plain language. So where do you start? Your instinct might be to start at the beginning, maybe with the title page or the first sentence of the introduction. That's not what we recommend. Instead, our recipe is to start by writing the heart of the paper first, 
which are the paragraphs where you analyze themes in the research. You can use the summaries you just wrote to help you and add the reference list entries and in-text citations as you go. Wait to write the introduction until after you've written the heart of the paper. It's much easier to introduce something if you know what it is that you're introducing. Also wait to give your paper a title until you've written the paper so that your paper title reflects the topic and variables that you ended up writing about. Likewise, write the conclusion last after you know what conclusions you've come to. Each paragraph that you write in an academic paper should express a single idea in standard academic paragraph structure. That means that the first sentence of the paragraph should state the main idea of the paragraph, and subsequent sentences in that paragraph then provide more information and details to support the main point. I remember this as one paragraph, one idea. Common pitfalls are trying to cram too many details into one sentence and including details that don't belong in that paragraph, but maybe in a different paragraph. To address these pitfalls, check each sentence of every paragraph to ensure the details are necessary and support the main idea of the paragraph. Move sentences that don't belong to a better spot. Paragraphs can also get too long and complicated. And if that happens, break the idea down into smaller pieces and give each idea its own paragraph. As you look at your paragraphs, you might also encounter problems with redundancy or repeating yourself. This is really common. And a good strategy for catching redundancy is to reread your paper at least a day after you've written a first draft and to look at it with fresh eyes. And yes, that means you have to start writing at least two days before the assignment is due. Maybe you thought you were making two points, but really it's the same point said two different ways. Instead of going around and around, remove redundant sentences and condense information into tightly written sentences. Other redundancy problems can happen because of problems with the logic of your paper organization. Make sure you present ideas in a logical order so that you don't have to loop back to explain ideas multiple times. The ideas of the paragraph should focus on themes in the literature. If you just describe each study individually without synthesizing the information and addressing the overall picture, You've basically written an annotated bibliography, not a literature review. The example on screen shows how one sentence can establish a theme of protective factors with information on the three factors of structured daily activities, social connectedness, and physical activity coming from different studies. Here's that sentence again. Now the first sentence of a themed paragraph about protective factors. The subsequent sentences elaborate on what the individual studies found. Notice how the sentences that provide more detail go in the same order as the factors were mentioned in the first sentence of the paragraph. Doing it this way makes it easier to follow. Now in your paper, you might have more to say about each factor in which case you might have separate paragraphs for each factor, again, going in order, and that would be fine too. As you discuss themes, you'll need to describe studies. When describing studies, it's important to consider what details are relevant to include. If the work involved human participants, you'll probably want to report the sample size and sample demographics. Age, race and ethnicity, and gender are common demographics to report, but other characteristics might be salient to your topic too, such as socioeconomic status or nationality. For whatever details you decide are necessary to include, make sure that you report parallel information for the various studies. Like, 
if you report the ages of participants in one study, report it for all the studies. Providing parallel information allows you to compare and contrast studies, and it helps readers understand the generalizability of the research, meaning how well it can apply to the real world. Finally, pro tip, when you're describing methodology, which is what the researchers did, use the past tense or the present perfect tense, not the present tense, because the research itself has already happened. In addition to describing themes, you'll need to evaluate the strengths and limitations of the literature. This evaluation can happen throughout the paper as you go through the studies, or you can evaluate the strengths and limitations of the research within a labeled section or sections. Address the patterns you see. For example, maybe the research had diverse groups of people in the sample, but maybe most of those samples had, were small. Once you've described and evaluated the literature in the heart of your paper, you'll be ready to write a very important sentence, the thesis statement, which is the take home message of your paper. Put the thesis statement near the end of your introduction to establish what is the point of your paper. For our paper, the thesis statement is, it is vital to understand what factors protect adolescent mental health and what factors put adolescent mental health at risk in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's common to refine or even discover your thesis statement during the writing process. We highly recommend marking your thesis statement, such as by attaching a comment to it or highlighting it, so that when you've finished a first draft of your paper, you can A, make sure your paper has a thesis statement, and B, go back to it and update it to make it more clearly fit what you actually ended up writing about in the body of the paper. Now for some tips on writing. When writing academic papers, it's common for student writers to use too many direct quotations. In contrast, when you look at published research, you'll see direct quotations are rare and paraphrasing is the norm. We recommend that you try to write your literature review without quotations if you can. Paraphrasing instead of quoting will force you to understand the material better, and it will make your writing sound more like you versus a collection of other people's voices. Limit your use of direct quotations to when it's important how something was said and not just what was said. A good example of when to paraphrase instead of quote is when you're providing definitions. Don't write the dictionary defines whatever term as and then quote a definition. Instead, paraphrase the definition and cite it parenthetically. For example, a paraphrased definition of psychological distress can include the context of the pandemic, whereas the quoted definition of psychological distress cannot. The paraphrased definition also sounds like I wrote it, because I did, whereas the quoted definition sounds like it came from a reference book, because it did. The goal with your language in an academic paper is to communicate complex and abstract concepts with language that everyone will understand, or plain language. Don't try to sound smart. If you don't understand what you're saying, readers won't either you can write a literature review. Don't repeat academic jargon. Figure out what the jargon means and write paraphrased sentences with the meaning you uncovered. If you need a more complicated term, make sure you explain it on first use. If you get lost in too long sentences, break them up into shorter sentences so that you can unfold the meaning one step at a time. A great strategy to achieve the goal of plain language and shorter sentences is to read your paper to yourself out loud. You'll discover awkward phrasing and confusing sentences, and you can rewrite them until everything flows smoothly. 
Here's an example of a complicated sentence about attachment style we found in one of our sources. There's nothing grammatically wrong with the original sentence, but it could be simpler. I rewrote it as, children with sensitive caregivers are more likely to develop a secure attachment style, meaning the children think of themselves as competent and perceive others as dependable. If you practice rewriting what you read, which is what paraphrasing is, you will understand your material better and communicate your ideas better. So the example writing so far has of course included citations, but now I'm gonna to speak directly to how to avoid plagiarism, including the importance of citing your sources, how one citation can apply to multiple sentences, when to repeat citations, and when citations are not needed. It's important to cite your sources because this gives credit to the people who did the work to do the science and publish the research. Giving proper credit also allows readers to trace the accumulation of knowledge over time so they can understand why current conclusions based on previous research are justified. If you don't give credit, that's plagiarism. Other citation mistakes aren't plagiarism per se, but they are still bad writing practice and can impact your grade. These include having citations or references that are formatted incorrectly or that are missing important information, oversighting, and putting citations in the wrong place. For the task of getting your citation formats correct, check out the reference examples landing page on the APA style website. For a literature review, you're most likely to need references from the journal article references page, which shows examples of the standard format as well as variations, such as works with article numbers or with missing information. All of the reference examples also show the parenthetical and narrative in-text citations that go with the references. The other two citation mistakes I mentioned, over citation and putting citations in the wrong place, tend to happen in the context of writing multiple sentences or even a whole paragraph about a single source, what is called a long paraphrase. To cite a long paraphrase, put the citation in the first sentence of the paragraph to which the source applies. As long as context makes it clear that you're discussing the same source and you don't use any other sources within that paragraph and there are no direct quotations, you should not recite the source within the paragraph. Overcitation is what happens when you unnecessarily repeat a citation in a long paraphrase, such as in every sentence or every other sentence or in the first and last sentence. Overcitation is incorrect. Putting that many citations to the same source in a row makes writing harder to read. Another common mistake is to put only one citation at the end of a long paraphrase instead of at the beginning. There's not an official term for this, but I'll call it a delayed citation. Instead of waiting, it's important to cite a source as soon as you use it because you wanna be upfront with readers about what your source is. These sentences from our themed paragraph show how one citation applies to two sentences for each of the three examples. The citation appears in the first sentence so that readers know right away what the source is. The source doesn't change and it's clear that the topic is the same for the next sentence because of clues in the sentence structure. So it's not necessary to repeat the citation. Since it's a common error to repeat a citation when it's not needed, I showed where the unnecessary citations would have gone and crossed them out. Here's an example of a paragraph long paraphrase, which is also one of the article summaries we wrote. As you can see, the source is cited in the first sentence. It's a narrative citation 
which is often an effective strategy for introducing a long paraphrase. Again, I've used strike through on the text to show where repeated citations are not needed in the subsequent sentences of this paragraph. If you read published articles, you'll find many examples similar to this. Now, sometimes you do need to repeat a citation. You should repeat a citation if you switch from one source to another and back again, or if you think it may be unclear to readers what the source is. Also, if you use a direct quotation, make sure there is a full citation with the author date and page number in the sentence with the quotation, regardless of whether the source has already been cited in that paragraph. You should also recite the source if your long para paraphrase is two or more paragraphs long. This makes it so readers don't have to depend on reading a different paragraph to know the source for the second paragraph. Here's an example of a paragraph with repeated citations. Both sources apply to the first sentence. The second sentence applies only to Laurier et al. So the citation to Laurier et al. is repeated. The third sentence applies only to Shoshani and Kaur. So that citation is repeated. The final sentence applies to both studies. However, a repeated citation is not needed here because the context clue of the words together these results makes it clear that both sources are again being cited. Last, let's talk about when sources are not needed, when you're writing about common knowledge and when you're writing your own contribution. What's common knowledge is subjective, but here's an example. For our topic, it's certainly common knowledge that the pandemic has caused a lot of stress and involved restrictions on regular life, such as lockdowns and social distancing. You don't need to cite that common knowledge. However, if you include statistics about the pandemic, information people would be unlikely to know off the top of their head, such as maybe how many people have been infected so far, you should provide a citation. Likewise, you should not cite your own contribution. Anything in the paper that isn't tied to a source and isn't common knowledge, by default, must be your contribution. Examples of your contribution include when you describe the importance and context of your topic, when you provide your thesis statement, when you analyze and critique the research, and when you provide your ideas for future research. So let's put all this advice into the context of paper format. Next, I'll explain the overall paper structure to follow and give you some tips on getting it right. The overall structure of a basic literature review paper can be divided into the sections of title page, text, and reference list. The title page is where you tell your instructor what your paper is called, who you are, what class it's for, and when you wrote it. Next comes the text of the paper, which includes the introduction with your thesis statement at the end, body paragraphs, a discussion of strengths and limitations, and a conclusion where you summarize and give ideas for future research. After the text goes the reference list, which should include the reference list entries for all the works that you cited in your paper. Here's the title page for our paper. We chose the title, Protective and Risk Factors for Adolescent Mental Health During the COVID-19 Pandemic, a Literature Review. Notice how this title captures the ideas in our thesis statement, and it says that it's a literature review. For more information on title pages, check out the title page setup guidelines on our APA style website. The text begins with the introduction on page two after the title page. The goal of an introduction is to explain what your topic is and why it is important. Place your thesis statement near the end of the introduction. 
You can also end the introduction with a sentence describing what you'll cover in your literature review. Here's our sentence. Note that the introduction does not have a heading called introduction. Instead, the paper title is repeated at the top of the first page of text, in bold and centered. The beginning of the paper is always the introduction, so you don't need to label it introduction. You should also use headings in your paper, which basically provide an outline of the content. The headings are flexible and depend on your topic. For our literature review, we used a main heading of protective factors at level one, which is bold and centered, and later a main heading of risk factors. To learn more about headings, visit our headings page on the APA style website. The conclusion is the last section of the text. And the goal here is to summarize your take home message and to give some ideas for future research. It's usually written in the present tense or the future tense. Our idea for future research is for researchers to examine what interventions or practices will help support and rebuild adolescents' mental health as the pandemic recedes. The conclusion is usually a labeled section. It can be a level one section with a bold centered heading like this, or it can be a level two section of a discussion section like this. Your last paper section is the reference list. It begins on a new page with the label references in bold and centered. We recommend that you add references to your reference list as you write the text. When you're done writing, it's crucial to check that all the works in the reference list are cited in the text and that all the works cited in the text are in the reference list. Don't forget to check this. For more help with reference list format and order, check out a free handout on the APA Style website called the Creating an APA Style Reference List Guide. This brings us to the conclusion. I'll share some takeaways, some other digital resources that APA offers for writing papers and supporting information for this presentation. Then we'll open up the floor for questions. So I know we covered a lot today, but I hope that this webinar has helped demystify the process of researching and writing a literature review paper. The biggest takeaways I hope you remember are that when you're writing a literature review, you're thinking and writing like a scientist. By learning to evaluate secondary sources in the context of primary sources, you can avoid the misleading secondary sources and use the helpful secondary sources to further your understanding of the primary sources. You can strategically prepare to write through targeted reading, adding keywords of interest to focus your topic, and using the research article activity to help you understand the studies before you write about them. Remember that you don't have to write your paper in order. It's often helpful to write the heart of the paper first and to wait to write the introduction, conclusion, and paper title. Within the text, write paragraphs using simple language, following our recommendations for appropriate citation level to make sure that you tie information immediately to its source, but that you don't unnecessarily repeat citations. Last, assemble your paper into the sections of title page, text, and reference list. Check it one last time for mistakes, and you're ready to submit. For more help, I have two digital resources for writing papers to share with you. The first is the Mastering APA Style Student Workbook, which is the official interactive guide to learning APA style. This online workbook is for students and it will teach you the basics of APA style and scholarly writing. You can learn more about the workbook on our website and even try a free sample. Also check out Academic Writer. 
which is a digital platform for writing papers and creating references in APA style. Academic Writer takes care of a lot of the formatting for you, including getting the font, margins, line spacing, page headers, headings, in-text citations, and reference list format and order right. It also features a library of tutorials and quick guides about style, writing, and research. Last, we'll make many supporting resources available to you after this webinar in what's called an Open Science Framework or OSF depository, including a copy of the slide deck, copies of the research assignment activity, and a blank as that as a blank form and as an example completed activity, a webinar resources document with links to all the resources that I mentioned, and a sample literature review paper from our website. So now we'll have a Q&A session and my colleague Haley will pose some questions that you all provided in the chat. And while we're doing the Q&A, I'll leave you with information on how to connect with the APA style team. Thanks Chelsea for that excellent presentation. So the Q&A is now open, so feel free to drop any questions into the, the Q&A uh, section of the webinar. And I'll start with just a couple questions that I've seen uh, come in recently. Um, so one question we got, Chelsea, is maybe can you talk a bit about the difference between introduction and conclusion of a paper and how they might differ given that they're both kind of the more general sections of a literature review paper? That's a great question. So the question is, how are an introduction and conclusion section different? Hmm. I would say I would say that the introduction really starts with sort of the big picture, maybe common knowledge stuff that most people are likely to know, and then you sort of bring the reader to the thing that you want to talk about. So, for example, for our paper, you might start by talking about how the pandemic has affected everyone and then say an, an especially important area we're gonna focus on is adolescent mental health. And you might talk about why adolescence is an important period of human development. And that's why it's important to like look into this area and know what science says we can do to support adolescents during the pandemic. In contrast, in the conclusion, you're gonna have more specific details about what actually is gonna matter. So you might know that, you might see that social support is a huge factor for making sure that adolescents, adolescent mental health is, 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 uh, is, is being as good as it can be during the pandemic. Like for example, one of the studies uh, says that physical activity really helps adolescent mental health, how, and also structured daily routines really help, but it only helps if social support is there as well. And so you would be able to incorporate more of these details. Um, the conclusion is also more future reach, reaching. So you would wanna say like, what would we wanna do in the future to keep examining this topic? Like some of the studies in the paper were cool because the researchers had already started examining a topic and then the pandemic happened and then they could turn their study into a longitudinal study. So they have before the pandemic and after the pandemic um, test and measures. So like they might have another time follow-up or maybe they devise an intervention and then see how that intervention um, affects, affects the adolescent mental health as well. Great, I think that's a great explanation. And so one question I've seen um, a few people post in the Q&A is about a method section of a literature mm -hmm. review. So I think we're all used to when you're writing um, an empirical research study, there to be a method section Mm -hmm. But would you expect to see that in a literature review uh, paper? Do you have to describe the quote unquote methods of your literature review? Um, for instance, what database you searched, inclusionary and exclusionary criteria? How yeah, would you I, I think that's definitely something that people do. Um, and an example of what that would look like is you would say 
like Haley mentioned, like you would say where you looked and what keywords you used to figure out what studies you were going to include. And this would be helpful to your readers because then if they wanted to replicate what you did, they could, they could go follow your instructions. Um, I do think it's flexible about whether it needs to be like labeled method section, but explaining what you did is I think always a good, a good plan. Great. And then there's a question here about what if you have, and I think what it's getting at is if you have sources that are both, you know, an empirical single study as well as um, a literature review that cites that study, you know, how do you handle citing both the review and the primary source in your paper? And I think to me, this connects a lot with, um, you know, citing secondary sources. Mm -hmm. So you're getting information in a literature review that came from a primary source. Do you cite the primary source, the literature review? Do you put both in your reference list? Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a great question. And like when that's happened to me before, I'm like reading a literature review that somebody else wrote and I'm like, well, what's the point of my paper? Somebody already did this. And you like that's that's a legitimate concern. And you should say to yourself, well, like, how are you addressing something different? And and also, are you sure that they're right? And so if you do find a literature review about your topic, I would say to look at the sources that the, the authors really relied on and to go look at them yourself because the authors are never gonna summarize everything that was in the original paper. And they might have like a different angle on what was important to them versus what's important to you. And I, I really think that once you go look at the original yourself, you're gonna have more ideas and it's gonna become more of you citing that primary source rather than just sort of regurgitating what the literature review says. So I would definitely focus on going to the primary sources yourself doing that legwork. Great. And you talked a little bit in the presentation about, you know, how to craft your sentences and paragraphs. Mm -hmm. So there's just a question here about a threshold of maybe how long um, a sentence is and a paragraph should be? Does APA kind of set those standards or have recommendations for sentence and paragraph length? So that's a great question. And before I answer it, I did think of one further thing for the question about uh, citing a, an existing literature review. It would be good to include that citation because if the literature you review you found was helpful to you, it would probably be helpful to other people too. Um, so, but the question about sentences and is there a limit on length for sentences and paragraphs? Yes. Yes. So limit or guidelines. So there's not an exact number, but there are sort of some extremes that it becomes not good if you go there. So if you have one sentence for a paragraph, that's too short. If your sentence goes on and on and on, it's hard to say what exactly that means, but like the, the, the sentence from the study I showed of the primary source of, of the limitations, like in my opinion, that sentence is too long. They use semicolons to connect a lot of sentences. And I think in that case, it's easier to, to break it up. Um, a good way to look for this is when you are writing your paper, if you read it out loud to yourself, you will notice if the sentence goes on too long because you're gonna run out of breath and you start forgetting where you are in the sentence. And so listening to yourself talk it can be a good method of finessing what a good sentence length is. But I, I do think it depends on the person of like what your writing is like, but then on the whole, the sentences people tend to write tend to be too long, but that they would notice that if they read them out loud to themselves and then they would be able to go back and tighten it up. And I guess a, a related question is maybe for the overall literature review, how long or short that sh should be. I feel like that probably depends a lot on context, whether it's a st student paper literature review or a published literature review. But do you think there's like a good rule of thumb about the overall length of a literature review, the number of studies it should cover, you know, how that varies based on the specificity of the topic or how much research there is there? Yeah, those are that's a great question. 
certainly you're going to get guidance from your assignment. Like if it's a school paper, they're probably going to tell you how long they want it. If you're writing for a professional publication, there are also usually um, expectations for how long that the paper should be. And if you're, say, reporting the results of an empirical study that you did, the literature review should be fairly brief. Like, uh, like thinking on papers, I would say it's definitely less than a quarter of the total paper is the literature review. Um, as far as the overall number of studies that you're citing, I feel like that depends on what the topic is and how much research exists about it. Certainly, it can be really helpful if there are existing literature reviews or like existing meta-analyses that are sort of themselves summary articles. Those can be really good to cite um, rather than like having tons of individual citations. That can be a good way to go to go about it. Um, but a lot just depends on the topic and like how much how much is out there. And if you feel like there's too much, maybe you need to focus your topic more. So that's, yeah, that's another idea. I think that's a great point. I mean, I think some really understudied topics will by default have a smaller literature review because there's yeah. just less to summarize there versus, like you said, you know, widely researched topics. And maybe to really limit that scope, you got to really narrow in on the topic of your paper to make it more yeah. manageable and achieve yeah. the because along with student paper limits, they're going to run into journal article limits in terms of, you know, page count. So those, you have to be mm -hmm. mindful of that as well, kind of right. structuring your paper. And you were just talking about, you know, some of the sources to use and looking at the literature that's out there. And I feel like you mentioned um, in the paper a lot of journal articles, and that's probably the standard source from which people are looking to get information from a literature yeah. review. But what about like other um, authoritative sources like a government report or, um, you know, other literature from a specific, like an organization's web page? Mm -hmm. like, would those be good sources for literature review? I think absolutely. It definitely depends on who is putting the information out there. So like, for example, there's lots of government agencies that um, maybe conduct surveys of the public and can publish statistics. Like if you want to cite like stuff from the CDC about um, medical stuff, like that would be an, an awesome source. Um, likewise, there are nonprofit organizations or advocacy organizations that also have conducted their own research that you might cite, or maybe they have like resources that are important to understanding the topic and so you would want to provide those so yeah yeah don't don't you know you're definitely not just limited to journal articles but if you're talking about research research studies tend to be in journal articles is kind of why the majority of it ends up being journal articles in my in my uh, experience Absolutely, that makes sense. And I'll mention that APA style doesn't really set those standards around, you know, what's a good scholarly resource. We definitely recommend, you know, jur empirical journal articles and peer-reviewed journals, yeah. um, government reports. But usually, you know, if it's for a class, an instructor might specify, you know, what they consider appropriate as your yeah. source. Sometimes it helps to look at, you know, more generic web pages and Wikipedia pages if you just need a background on a topic that's new to you. So Absolutely. Those can be useful as like background information, even if you don't cite them um, in your For paper. Sure. Yeah, Wikipedia has a ton of great links to citations of authoritative sources, especially about like very widely discussed topics. So that could be a great gateway to finding original research when it's a new topic to you. Great. And when you're collecting that information and putting it into your paper, you mentioned to avoid using direct quotations, that it's better to paraphrase. What about if it's statistical information, which can be hard to, to paraphrase? Um, is it okay to, to, to cite statistics and results from um, you know, equations or analyses? Mm -hmm. Is that still considered a quotation if you, you know, report those numbers directly? I don't, I don't think so. I would think about like, what is the use of the numbers to the readers? Like in the original study, they'll, report exactly what statistics they used and like if it's an ANOVA they'll have the F values and the P values and you'll see the effect sizes and all that and that level of detail repeating that level of detail I don't 
necessarily think is necessary in a literature review because it's more of like a broad picture. However, some statistics definitely would be relevant to readers to know. Um, like for example, in one of the studies, like in the studies in for our example paper, you would wanna say how many participants there were. And repeating that information isn't, a, is, it's not a direct quotation. Like the fact that there were 1500 participants you don't need to put that in quotation marks. It's just a fact from the study. Um, so do you think do you think that addresses the question there? Yeah, I think so. I think if it comes to numbers, there's not as much concerns about directly quoting because the numbers are what they are. Yeah. But I agree you should really be thinking thoughtfully about the intent there. And if it's yeah. better to just kind of summarize what the findings were than to report straight statistics. And I feel like yeah. that's what students do a lot. They just think they're summarizing the results by just kind of copying and pasting those numbers in, but yeah. that's not really getting at the heart of, you know, what the findings are, really communicating to the mm -hmm. reader kind of what the, the point is and why, it, yeah. why it's important. For sure, like like some of the statistics that might be important are like what percentage of people are experiencing something or um, if a study found like an enormous effect size and it was really significant, um, you, might, you might refer to that as, as two examples. As well. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And so we are at four o'clock. I think Chelsea, you and I are happy to stay and answer some more questions, but I'm sure um, attendees might have to drop out. So I'll keep reading through some of those. But for anyone um, who's looking to access the slides, the recording will be available on the Psychi website within the next week or so. And we also have the slide deck as well as resources Chelsea mentioned in the presentation on our Open Science Framework page. And that link is in the chat, um, osf.io slash c96jy there. And you should be able to get a couple of PDFs and then depth in the slide deck and download all those. Mm -hmm. If you have other questions about APA style, I also dropped in the chat um, our email, styleexpert at apa.org. And so you can email that to ask any questions about APA style. Or you can learn more about uh, APA style guidelines, the resources Chelsea mentioned on the APA style website, which I also just dropped the link to in the chat. So we look forward to being in touch and thanks for attending. And like I said, I'll, I'll keep posing some questions while I still see um, attendees there. And then once yeah. I get maybe close to zero, we can uh, call it quits. Sure. So one question I've seen uh, at least two people ask is maybe about differences for literature review if you're writing um, a journal article versus a thesis or a dissertation. Mm -hmm. And so the latter, the thesis and dissertation do tend to be longer and more involved. Yeah. And so what that might mean for the literature review pieces of them as compared to a journal article. Ooh. I feel like the the size of the if it's if a literature review is a part of a paper, that it the percentage maybe stays the same, but the overall length will expand and contract depending on the length of your dissertation. Like if your dissertation is 200 pages long, maybe your literature review is, you know, 30 pages. I'm making these numbers up, but you like obviously it wouldn't be the whole thing and it wouldn't just be two pages in, in comparison to the full length. Um, what is your experience with that, Haley? Since Yeah, having been a grad student not that yeah. long ago, I would think say that the literature review for a dissertation certainly is longer than that for a journal article. And that yeah. reflects kind of the 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 purpose of those different you know forms of communication. I mean a journal article is really addressing a specific study on a specific topic. And so a really literature review can be pretty kind of limited in scope to that topic to provide the background. Yeah. Readers need to understand kind of the methods and results of your study. A dissertation is really intended in a lot of ways to kind of demonstrate that graduate student's knowledge of a topic. So the expectation is, is that there's, they've done, they're really providing a summary of the research in its entirety on that topic. Yeah. So that's why it tends to be longer. You're really demonstrating your knowledge, your breadth of knowledge of that topic, and that you've yeah. kind of done the legwork to investigate that whole field. And so there is an expectation that it'll be longer, that's why we recommend in the manual, I know a lot of advisors, we'd obviously have to speak to your advisor about this, but recommend structuring a dissertation as a journal article or several separate journal articles so that it's easier to convert that into a journal article um, after you defend your dissertation. 
because uh, the point of conducting research is often to disseminate and share those results. And so if you kind of structure your dissertation in that way, it's kind of makes that transition and shortening it down easier to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, Again, that's just been my experience. And yeah, that's awesome. Thank with you. your dissertation <laughs> advisor. Um, and so here's another citing question is whether you have a sentence that has citations from two different sources. So how do you, you handle that? Do you have to, you know, how would you handle having two sources in the same sentence? So Inside. is it that you are reading a study and in that study, their sentence has two citations in it? I think maybe we can talk about both. If you're reading a, a, a sentence like that and if you're writing a sentence, is it okay to have two sources in the same sentence? To the second part, definitely you can have two sources in the same sentence. Definitely. Um, if there's like two sources that sort of back up the same point, definitely you can cite them together. Uh, for the case of if you're reading research and you see a sentence that is it's like exactly what you need, and those authors have like a string of citations at the end of their sentence, and it's like, I, 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 know, I know the question, it's like, how far are you supposed to go to figure out what you're supposed to cite? And definitely it depends, but I think that in most cases, when the article you're reading has a sentence and then lots of studies that support it, those authors have sort of summarized or synthesized those other studies. And general practice in that case is to cite the work that you read and not to repeat the citations that are in their sentence unless you also use those works. I would say an exception is if the authors are like just di directly describing a study, like you should go read that one yourself. But if they're sort of like meshing studies together, then you can just cite the article that you read. Because you're paraphrasing what that article you read is saying. Yeah. But again, I, I agree with the recommendation to is whenever possible to go back to the primary source. I think we've yeah. definitely seen, it's kind of like a game of telephone sometimes that when yeah sources are cited in other sources, the message can kind of get lost or distorted. So we also always recommend, you know, going with the primary source um, unless mm -hmm. it's unavailable for some reason to really make sure you're getting the most accurate information. Mm -hmm. And I also saw um, one or two questions about the difference between a literature review and a systematic literature review. And I think that that might harken back to that earlier question about having a method section. Mm -hmm. Uh, this really comes into play with the systematic literature review, where you want to really make clear your plan and protocol and have implemented a systematic way of going through literature. Yes. And so that's why the question is, is a systematic literature review considered more, more rigorous? And I would say yes, because they're, they'll usually clearly elaborate on their methods so it can be replicated, and they have a clear protocol for how they get included or excluded studies, yeah. um, what they looked for. And that would be one where you would definitely expect a method section. Yeah, where the literature review can sometimes be a little bit more, um, uh, you know, just kind of an overview of the literature and just looking at yeah. studies on a topic, maybe less systematically. So here's a question about how to use um, second level headings and when it's appropriate to use them. I think we hear a lot about, you know, questions about people are familiar with kind of the level one headings, um, you know, method, results, discussion. Mm -hmm. So can you maybe talk a little bit more about how to use headings to organize a paper, when it may, might make sense to include, uh, you know, level two headings under those level one headings, um, just kind of, you know, how headings help structure a paper? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. I think that... So imagine that you're starting with the paper and you only have method results discussion or you only have the level one headings and you're like, how many more headings should I add? To a degree, it matters how long the different sections are because if the paper is not that long, you might not need level two headings. But if the sections are really long, presumably there are different topics or different like main points that you make within the sections. And so like, for example, for like our example paper, if you're talking about protective factors for adolescent mental health, 
if we were really getting into lots of details, we might have specific sections about daily routine, another level two heading about social connectedness, and then another one about physical activity, because like those are the three big ones that we were examining. So the headings are sort of like an outline of the paper. And like when you scan the headings, you should be able to get an idea of like what what's the paper about and what's going on. So level two headings can definitely help with that. Um, for some paper sections, there are standard ones that you, that you might expect to see. Like you might definitely want to see a limitations section because that's where you're gonna put the limitations within your discussion. And, and likewise, you might have definitely have a conclusion section. Um, that makes sense. Do you have any thoughts on that, Haley? No, I just think it's a great point about, you know, how many headings you have really are dictated by the length of your paper. Yeah. And you're not required to have really have any headings other than the title. If it's a really short, maybe say right. discussion post for a student, you could just have level one headings. If it was a very really kind of short, straightforward study, or you may need, you know, to get down to level five headings. If you are writing, say, a dissertation that had a lot of methods and really detailed in groups and subgroups. So you really just have to yeah. evaluate and how does it make it, you know, what's the best organization and labeling to help and readers get to the information they need. And that's mm -hmm. ultimately what your paper to achieve is to help, you know, readers understand what you did and, you know, read and understand that information. So use that mm -hmm. to kind of inform how you're breaking up and organizing your paper with headings. Right. And here's kind of a straightforward question, I think. So we, we know that sometimes the same journal article uh, can be published in multiple places. So let's say you have a choice between a study published as a dissertation or an early online article or you know, the published form in the journal. Is there kind of a recommendation on which version of the same like paper or study to, to cite? There is. It's called the version of record. Generally, that's the published in the journal version. It usually has a DOI that is like the article identifier. Advanced online, advanced online publications are a version of record. The reason that they're called advanced online publications is that when uh, research is published, it's assembled into volumes and issues. But since now everything's on the internet, the way publishing works is like the article's ready, it's done and it's ready for the journal, but the other articles in the in the volume aren't ready yet, so they just put it up on the website or in the database, and they label it in advance on love to indicate that it doesn't have volume pages and or an issue number assigned yet. But that's definitely an authoritative source. And later in time, it can take months um, for it to be assigned volume issue and pages. Great. And so I just want to reiterate, um, there's still you know a good number of people. In, in the attendees list, so we'll continue to answer questions. Um, I know I've seen questions about um, accessing it. So again, the recording of the webinar will be available on the SciChi website within the next week or two. And if you look in the chat, you should see the link to our Open Science Framework page. Um, it has the slides for download as well as other resources. So please check that mm -hmm. out if you're still with us. All right, back to a couple uh, more questions. So um, here's a question about someone saying, I think putting citations in the beginning of every sentence kind of breaks up the flow of writing or can get monotonous. Can you use a mix in terms of where you place citations, say in the beginning of, of a sentence, the end of a sentence, the middle of a sentence? Is that okay? Or are there recommendations around kind of where to place citations in the context so the question, of a sentence? So the question is where to place a citation within a sentence? Um, I think I think it's really drawing on your suggestion with long paraphrases that the citation yeah. come at the beginning of the sentence and the, the questioner oh, is saying okay. that that could kind of break up the flow of writing. So I guess yeah. maybe clarify that it's always required for a citation to come at the beginning of a sentence. Yeah. Are the violence around there? Can those citations be in different places and different sentences? Right. So to be clear, the citation just needs to be in the first sentence. It doesn't need to be at the beginning of the first sentence as long as that one sentence is just about one source. So like the one that I showed had the citation with a narrative citation, it had the author's names in the sentence. 
And like, if you do it that way, it's useful because like you have the author's names and then later in the paragraph, you can just say, and then the researchers did X and then they did Y and you're using um, other nouns and pronouns to refer to the researchers' names and that is is a citation, but it's not like you're not repeating Smith comma 2022 in every sentence. Um, in terms of like that first sentence that you're writing, I would say to if you're going to use a parenthetical citation to put it at the end of the sentence, I think it would be like unless unless there's multiple sources within one sentence, in which case you want to put the citation next to the information that it goes with. Does that make sense, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think the bottom line is maybe there is no kind of rule for where a citation yeah. should go. It just has to make sure you're clearly uh, citing the source of that yeah. information. Yeah, so the clear, the, the, for sure. Like the biggest thing is just not to wait. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you have a long paraphrase that span multiple sentences. I think a right. lot of times we see the um, the defaults are people to put that at the end because they think right. it's like clarifying the source of all that preceding information. But you're saying it needs to go at the beginning so people know mm -hmm. right your readers know right off the bat the source of that information. Mm -hmm. Right. Because from your perspective as the writer, you know that you've started talking about that sentence. But like your readers aren't mind readers. They don't know. They're coming at this with fresh eyes. And so if you just pop it into the at the beginning of when you start talking about the topic and then you can keep going and they'll be able to follow along within the context and know that you're still talking about that source. Exactly. Whereas for other you know, shorter sentences, it might make sense at the beginning of it's say a narrative citation. Yeah. It might make sense at the end. It might even make sense in the middle if like you you know cited information and then have a an observation about it, you know, with a you know comma, like yeah, which, is, which I imply to mean something like that. So it does really vary. But it's always important yeah. to kind of also keep in mind the flow of your paper and, and citing information. Yeah, I mean, certainly with like APA style has author date citations versus like other styles that use um, footnotes or endnotes, where it's just like the little number, and then you would have to go look. At what the source is and like the reason it is that way in APA style is to bring um, attention to who the information is coming from and so like it's true the citations do sort of interrupt the 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 the, the sentences that you're writing for you to see you know this comes from this and this this comes from this source and you can see it right there but it's also helpful um, especially if it's say like you're citing statistics or something and then you can see right there that those statistics came from the CDC and they're brand new, readers would be appreciative of knowing that right away, I think. Yeah, agreed. And so not to kind of break up the flow of questions, but a question I've seen a couple times is whether there's any certificate um, for attending this webinar. And I just wanted to say that, I mean, no, there is not, at least on the APA uh, style side. So we welcome, we're really grateful that you attended and you're welcome to, to cite and, and tell people you attended. And this mm -hmm. recording will be public facing. Um, so you're welcome to, to view it later, to cite it. Again, if you go to our OSF page in the chat, um, you can download the slide deck. And I know a couple of people were mentioning they had trouble seeing it. Um, it doesn't look necessarily like a, a PowerPoint, but it is called Sci-Hi Webinar underscore March 2022 PPTX. So it has that kind of PowerPoint PowerPoint file format um, mm -hmm. fixed at the end. So just look for again Sci-Hi Webinar March 2022, and that once you download it, uh, should open the the slide deck in PowerPoint. Yep. That's in the repository. Yep, that's on the OSF yeah. page. Mm -hmm. And again, the link to that um, is in the chat. So um, here's a question. It's a little bit more of kind of maybe a high level question, but you know how to write about two con contradicting studies that can be kind of hard if you're trying to summarize the literature and you have one study that says one thing and it's another study that says the opposite thing. Mm. Do you have any recommendations for kind of summarizing those, talking about them without being biased towards one or another of the studies? That's a I great think, question. Yeah, I mean, I think. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I was gonna say, I mean, this really reminds me of the when you're talking about not kind of cherry picking sources. I mean, that's kind of the first piece that you just would mention both sources. Um, yeah. 
I think an establishing sentence where you say that there are competing or that there the research has shown mixed results, you could start by saying that so the readers understand that there's this difference in what's been revealed. And then you would say this one study found X, Y, Z. And then on the other hand, this other study found something else. And then you would probably have to address like if you have any ideas about why, why the differences are. So, and depending on the topic, like maybe there's theories about what's what's going on and you would just sort of look into that some more. And that could be a reason why it's, it's helpful in your literature review you to mention things like sample size, sample demographics, because all of those could influence why different studies got different results. Right, exactly. And then here's a question. Um, you mentioned a little bit about, you know, appropriately searching for studies. Can you give any suggestions on how to use um, keywords to optimize your search for articles? How to maybe when you're in a database, narrow or find your results to kind of get the studies that you want. Um, this reminds me a lot of like that tutorial we have an academic writer that talks about things like using like, um, you know, specific search terms and quotes around yeah. terms, the Boolean operators. And a lot of that right. I think can be found if you, you know, through a librarian at your school as well, will have great strategies for some of those kind of search um, refinement. Definitely. I, another important consideration is to like figure out what is the term that everybody's using. And then you search that term. Because sometimes for different concepts, there's different terms that are similar to each other. And uh, you just have to sort of look at look into it and see what's what's in there. Um, additionally, like APA publishes the APA Dictionary of Psychology, which is free online. It's at https um, dictionary.apa.org. And it's definitions of all different psychological terms. And if you look up the term in there, it'll tell you what the other terms it's known as. And so like that would give you some ideas too about like if you're if your term has like several different versions of, of a different name that it goes by, that would help you sort of figure out how to find everything. Great, I think that's a great strategy. Yeah, I definitely recommend looking at the AP Dictionary of Psychology, talking to a librarian at your school or your institution. They typically have great recommendations for kind of refining a search. And there's yeah. a ton of, um, I think, information online. If you just kind of Google ways to refine a search, again, use things like yeah. quotations around terms, use Boolean operators, use filtering yeah. to filter out by specific, you know, sample demographics, study types, just mm -hmm. peer review journal articles. There's lots of different publication years, there's lots of different ways you kind of refine results. Right. One of my favorites is um, in APA's database, PsychNet. You can narrow it to search, it's called psych articles, and there's a way to search the full text of the articles. And sometimes phrases that you're looking for, they're in the full text, but maybe they're not in the paper title or they're not in the abstract. And like if you're looking for something really specific, and so being able to search the full text, I have found really helpful as well. And I do that by going um, into psych articles specifically. And then it's part, it's like one of the drop downs that you in the what field you want to search. And full text is one of the options. Great. And your mention of an abstract also, you know, maybe think of your point in the webinar that just reading the abstract is a great way to kind of pare down studies. You don't have to read the full study, you can just start yeah. with the one paragraph abstract to kind of get an early sense whether this article makes sense for literature you're writing and kind of eliminate studies that way. Yeah. I think too, as you read more abstracts, like say you've read 10 different abstracts, some of them kind of hang together. Like they, you can set, you can see that they're about the same topic and that they would go together. And maybe there's one that's different, that's less directly related. And so like that might be a study that you don't end up writing about. Exactly. And so here's a good question. I think it's something we um, talk about in the manual as well. So this idea of one idea per paragraph, what if your paragraph is too short? Like you just, you find yourself, it is only a one or two sentence paragraph. Mm -hmm. Did you just like have filler sentences, fill it in to kind of get to that optimal length? What are some ways to kind of flush out uh, a paragraph? Don't do filler sentences. Short? Definitely don't do filler sentences. That is uh, like, if you feel like the idea is just one short thing, maybe that idea is actually a part of a bigger idea. 
is yeah, what I, I would we, is probably yeah, going on. We, and I think that's what we say in the manual is to really rethink and think more on the topic and really flesh out your analysis. Yeah. And your, your uh, thought on that topic. It's probably more I, to say there, not just repeating the same thing with filler. Right. Right. I, I tend to find that I like I do a lot of my thinking on the page where I write about it, I write about it, and I look at what I've written and I kind of see the similarities and the themes of what I've written and then I can eliminate the redundancy. And if it's too short, I'm like, okay, well, what else is there to say? Is there another point that I'm missing? Is there another aspect that I could consider? And in that way, you end up like adding more content rather than just filler. Yeah, drawing more implications, more conclusions mm -hmm. from what you're you're seeing in that study or in the literature. Mm -hmm. And so here's someone who has concerns. It can be hard to read so many papers and retain and, and summarize all the information. You know, they're asking, is this a good way to retain the information? And I think maybe they're talking about the strategies you spoke about in the webinar, that research article activity. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that article in particular is a great way to kind of write down a study into easily understandable yeah. chunks and then use kind of the paraphrases to get at the, the heart of the information and use that to kind of summarize and make comparisons across studies. Would you agree? Definitely. I definitely do. Um, they're absolutely right. It can be hard. Sometimes even when I'm going, like I'll wait to read the full articles until I've like done the targeted reading on lots of different studies. And then I have sort of like big picture idea of what the various studies are and then I can refine it and go back and like read more thoroughly and take notes rather than like one by one okay I scanned the article it looks good I'm going to read the whole thing because you're right they're long and sometimes they're really hard to read and you just it's it's so complicated that your brain starts drifting away <laughs> um, so I think doing scanning the article, looking at the headings, doing the strategies we talked about in the targeted reading can be really helpful and that maybe you wait to do that in-depth read until like a little bit later in your selection process. That might help. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then maybe going back to a topic we discussed earlier about primary versus secondary site sources, here's someone asking, what if you can't find an article you want to cite for example, a paper you're referencing cites a paper and you want to, to cite that original paper in the literature review, but you can't find, you don't have access to that original yeah. paper, what should you do? Then you do the secondary source citation. That's when that's exactly when you would use it. And the way that you would do it is you would say you you would give the name of the the name and year of the the the, the, the primary source, the one that you haven't seen, and then comma as cited in, and then the name of the source that you did read. So, and there's information on how to do that in chapter eight of the publication manual. Exactly, and I think we also have some information for free on the APSI website, at least comparing primary versus secondary sources mm -hmm. um, in the general citation format, with even more information in chapter eight of the publication manual. Mm -hmm. And so here's a question, um, how do you balance using scientific terms and plain language? You know. There are some journals that are really easy to understand versus others that are often impo almost impossible for lay people to understand because of the scientific language. Mm -hmm. Any advice for kind of how to balance that need to be clear with the, the complex scientific jargon that can sometimes appear um, in yeah. published articles? That is such a good question. I always err on the side of simpler language. Because you're right, the articles that are hard to understand, they're hard to understand. And when you do use specific scientific terms, it depends on your audience about how, maybe how technical the vocabulary is going to be. Like the, the primary source that I used in the presentation that was really difficult to read was, it was published in Nature, which is like a really prestigious journal. But like the author, like the, the audience was clearly like a medical audience. They were using medical terms and presumably the people who were reading that are also deeply knowledgeable about that area. Um, versus if you're writing for a more general audience, then you're gonna wanna use simpler simpler language um, and I, I think that when you're in a, in a classroom environment it's more of a the audience of your peers is sort of who you're writing to because I, I don't think that you can write above the level 
that you're at. It just ends up being gibberish. So you have to, however you explain it has to be in a way that you understand is the most important thing, I think. Yes, yeah, it has to be interpretable or understandable to you and your audience. Yeah. So there's no point in writing the paper if they're not going to understand it. So you might need to simplify it. You might need to look up some of these terms yourself to get kind of a handle on them and describe them mm -hmm. in appropriate language. Um, yeah, again, and like the APA dictionary you can, can become helpful in that aspect sure. to clarify specific terms that are more complex. Yeah. And also looking at published studies that are in the genre, like in the area of what you are writing can give you a feel for how the language should be. Like the number one thing you can do to become a better writer is to read more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, really get familiar with the literature and how it's, mm -hmm. it's talked you start about. To, you start to like know what it sounds like and then you can do it too. Great, and here's another um, issue that's probably a common problem for writers. It's when you're writing a literature review, how to avoid citing too much from one source. When we talked about long paraphrases and sometimes mm -hmm. you need a couple sentences, but I feel like this is a common problem, especially for maybe student papers where you just get a full kind of summary yeah. of the study and that's not really what you want either. Right. How do you, is there any trips, tips for avoiding doing that for kind of like identifying maybe the key pieces or the most important things to talk about in a study? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. If you're only relying on like one source over and over again, then I would ask, have you found other good sources that are about the topic you're writing about? And if you haven't, maybe the topic is too narrow if you only have like one study to review. Maybe you mm -hmm. need to broaden it so that you can say like, what are the different perspectives in the ways that this question has been approached? Yeah, and I think you really need to evaluate, you know, what's most important on that topic to understand the literature. I mean, studies yeah. are going to report a lot in their methods sections if you can't report, you know, every um, yeah. detail about the sample or the measures. So I think you've got to really also think critically about what's most important to kind of understanding that literature and in context yeah. when you're comparing studies. Right. And and I think there's like a tendency that you're like, I know before, like I felt worried that I wasn't going to fill up all the pages that I had. And I was like, maybe I should report everything that they did because that will be more sentences and it's making my paper be the length that it needs to be. And if I trimmed those, then I wouldn't have enough. Well, if you trimmed, if you trimmed it and you don't have enough, then there needs to be more ideas. You need to take the topic further or or if it's too narrow, you need to broaden it or keep keep looking and seeing what else is out there um, so that you can get that that good fit. Great. And here's another follow up, um, I think, to an earlier question, just kind of confirming that each theme in your paper doesn't necessarily need a level two heading. Is that no. correct? Mm -mm. Yeah, definitely. Headings are like, you wrote the paper, you look at it, and how if, if you were looking for something in your paper and you're like, oh, how am I going to find that? A heading would be useful, especially if you were going to maybe talk about it to like one of your friends or somebody who's in your class. And you're like, oh, I found all this amazing information about physical activity and its its impact on mental health. And you would probably want to have a section about labeled physical activity and mental health because it'll help people find the most important stuff. Yeah, that's a great point. Let's see, so here's an interesting question. I know that confirmation bias is a problem when writing papers. Um, I've been part of a research lab with knowledge on this field of interest. So how do you find research articles that support the knowledge you already have? So I think, especially if it's not common knowledge. So I think mm. this is really getting at, you know, like, how do you avoid maybe falling into the trap of confirmation bias? You know, you go in expecting one thing. How do you make sure that your literature review is kind of impartial and mm -hmm. unbiased? Um, but how do you know, how do you also find articles that kind of support the knowledge you already have and are kind of establishing maybe a common knowledge? Maybe there's two pieces here to this question. My question, do you, Haley, do you think that that would be different than finding articles on knowledge that you don't have like wouldn't it be the same 
I would think so. I think maybe a lot. I think I know what happens would happen to me a lot of time as a writer, especially as a student, is I would have the point I wanted to make ahead of time. And yeah. then I would look for studies that supported that point. And I right. and I think, you know, that's one strategy. And maybe if you that might make sense in some cases, but I think we're really recommending maybe a more impartial approach that you kind of look at the literature and report it how it is. And that may or may yeah. not support your kind of preconceived notions um, going right. in. And that's really just about kind of having a system for how you identify sources, sticking mm -hmm. to that, and then reporting those sources as you find them without cherry picking. Yeah. Um, only those that support the point you, you're you trying to make or think you should make. Right. And it also depends on like how recent your knowledge of the topic is. Like if you've been studying something for a really long time and you're like, I definitely know whatever. And then you kind of forgotten where you got the information, what, where you got the information from, like, yes, it's work, but it's good to go and check that what you think is true is still true. By looking, by like using the keywords and searching for the articles, seeing has someone done a literature review about this or a meta-analysis about this, or you know what's the you know sort of groundbreaking study that supports some of the knowledge that you have, um, and connecting the pieces for people who don't have the same knowledge and experiences as you. Yeah, that's a great point. So it looks like we're now about 35, 36 minutes over. I saw a couple questions in the chat that are a little bit more specific about whether specific titles were too long. And I would just recommend um, emailing those to styleexpertapa.org if you have specific questions about your paper or the paper that you're writing. Um, Style Expert is a great way to kind of get that individualized yeah. feedback via email. So that email should be in the chat. Again, it's styleexpertapa.org. Mm -hmm. um, again, you can always visit the APA Style website at apastyle.apa.org to get a ton of free information. We have style and grammar guideline pages on mm -hmm. um, specific APA style topics from paper format, in-text citations and references to bias-free yeah. language, writing style and mechanics of style, as well as free handouts and guides, um, free recorded webinars, a basics of APA style tutorial. It kind of walks you through all the different elements of APA style one by mm -hmm. one, kind of a graphical interactive format. Um, yeah. It's an APA style blog where we provide kind of answers and more, more backgrounds on APA style topics. So again, yeah. if you go to APA style to APA.org, you can check all that out. Right, right. And, and two, uh, an, an idea I had while you were talking about the issue of paper title is that it's not necessarily about how long or short the title is. It's about how informative the different words in the title, in the title are. Mm -hmm. So like if you put a study of the effects of blah, blah, blah at the beginning of your title, like those, you don't need to put the words a study of in, in your title. Um, you do need to describe what something is if it's something special. Like if it's a literature review, you can put that it's a literature review in the title. If it's a meta-analysis, you can put that it's a meta-analysis in the title. Um, but for more like empirical research, the title tends to be like, we found that daily physical daily physical exercise improves adolescent mental health. Like that might be sort of um, it's like a one sentence summary of what the article says and all the words in there are sending information that's important to the reader. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of variety in how long or short the titles are out there. And it's also some a place where you can um, use some of your creativity, especially if you come up with a subtitle that sort of encapsulates, you know, what your topic is about. Um, like I know you saw in, like, in the presentation, I have all these things. So, oh, it's like searching is like online shopping or it's like reading spoilers for a movie, you know, things like that can grab people's attention and make your research stand out and be more memorable. And that's good. You want people to remember what you say because what you're saying is important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we have some great um, practical tips for writing titles in, what is it, chapter two of the publication manual as well mm -hmm. as chapter one of the concise guide. Yeah. And I think yeah. hearkening to your point about, you know, just getting more familiar with the literature. I think the more studies you read, you really get a sense of what titles look like, what effective yeah. titles look like, which ones draw you in, 
you know, with maybe their subtitles or by communicating important information or answering a question right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's also a tutorial about titles in Academic Writer. Yep, how to title your article. So that provides, mm -hmm. again, great kind of concrete strategies um, for writing a title with tons of examples. Mm -hmm. All right, I think those are most of the questions. Again, I saw in the chat. So again, if you have other questions, feel free to reach out to APA Style, a style expert at APA.org. Please uh, check back on the SciKai website for the recording of this webinar um, in the next day or week or so. And go to our um, Open Science Framework page where you can download um, the research activity handout that Chelsea mentioned, both a blank version and a completed one. So you can see what that looks like. You can download a PDF with a list of all the links and resources Chelsea mentioned in the presentation. And you can download the whole uh, slide deck with all these great graphics and information uh, that Chelsea put together. So again, that is um, the OSF link in the chat. And let's see if I can just move, paste it in again so it's at the bottom. Um, and thanks all so much for attending. Um, hopefully this was helpful and we've answered most, if not all, of your questions. It's been great talking to you, Chelsea. And thank you, Sai yes, for organizing this. Thank you, everybody. All right.